Good lord, here we finally are, with a 2023 update nearly at the end of 2023. Was this intended to come out four months ago? Yes! Did I do the animations in original VO ages ago, which required me to add in caveats, changes, and exceptions constantly to what's seen on screen as new information constantly comes out about projects? Oh yes. Have I rewritten pretty much every line of VO in this hour-long monstrosity at least three times? Yes. But we're finally here. Assuming this VO take will actually be in the final one. <sighs> anyway, yes, welcome back. It's been quite a year for me. Got married, moved, still in LA, don't worry. Been generally insanely busy, but now it's time to talk about the state of the Metro again. In some ways, it's been an eventful year for the LA Metro. After cascading delays in the northern half of the Crenshaw or K Line finally opened last October, and the regional connector opened in June. As for most of the rest of Metro's projects, well... Not great, Bob! If you're watching this video soon after upload, I'm about to release, probably within the next two months, hopefully, a video on the exploding costs and absurdly lengthening timelines for transit projects. So, if you want some details behind the upcoming misery, look out for it. I won't really be getting into the why of it, nor the how to solve it of it here. As usual, I'm going to be going roughly in order of the current timeline of expected openings, so let's get into it. Here is our lovely map, somewhat redesigned this year. First of all, it's twice the resolution for less fuzzy animations, and I've tried to make the lines and text thicker. I was also inspired by the awesome new map by designer Fern K. Han, which you can see here. And you can find more great work on their website, listed in the description. My favorite elements from this map, which I've borrowed, are showing more granular differences in how the light rail lines and BRTs operate by using the weight of the lines. In my version, sections of rail with full weight are fully grade separated, and segments with a thinner weight contain at least one grade crossing. For BRT, I have three weights. First, full weight for grade separated busways in their own lanes, just the J line freeway segments, really. Thinner weight for the BRT in dedicated lanes, but also with grade crossings and even thinner and dashed for mixed flow with street side stops, like in official Metro maps. I've also borrowed how they show this on the legend. Other notable changes are showing all five LA area airports and using a new language for out-of-station interchanges, where platforms are nearby but not technically within the same station structure. As for example, the Broadway BRT will be with the J-Line, one block off but still effectively operating as an express local service. With all that out of the way, let's see where we are in the year of our Lord 2023. You'll notice that the K-Line remains a little stub. One of the biggest questions looming over the opening date of the southern portion was the Sentinel grade separation, where, to recap, Inglewood Mayor James Butts was pushing for the brand new, never once used track to be torn out and replaced with a grade separated overpass so Sentinel traffic could flow freely. This would have cost an absolute fortune and held the full opening of the line back years and was, and I cannot stress this enough, incredibly stupid to add at this stage. Well, folks, we've got some unexpected good news. After years of them pushing back the decision on whether to move forward with this thing again and again, James Butts finally withdrew support for it and now wants to use whatever money would have been earmarked for it, probably from the local discretionary measure M funds for the South Bay City's Council of Governments, or COG, for the Inglewood People Mover instead. More on that later. This frees up the whole southern section of the Crenshaw line to open as soon as trains can go through the under-construction airport connector station, which was planning to open in the fall of this year. Then it looked like they would open everything together on July 31st of next year. Then it looked like they would open the southern portion of the line first and the station later. Now it looks like the People Boofer and Metro station aren't opening until October 17th of next year. And it's unclear if the southern portion of the line will open first or not. Honestly, at this point, your guess is as good as mine. Plus, there was one other lingering question. What will the service pattern be of the C and K lines? If you remember, there were three options under consideration this past year. C1 would see the South Bay portion become a short line to LAX, while the K line takes over the rest of the current C line. C2 would see the K line take over the South Bay portion of the C line and C3 would see a K-line takeover of the C, but with the South Bay section going east to Willowbrook instead of north to LAX, interlining the whole segment here. After much debate, C2 won out, so this is what the lines will look like by next summer. It was the most supported option. 
Both lines get direct airport access, and the travel patterns are a bit simpler and more consistent with future extensions. There was some suggestion that the C line could actually extend up to downtown Inglewood at some point after the Inglewood People Mover is built, so we'll keep an eye on that. In the fall of 2024, the Foothill extension to Pomona of the now A line is expected to be completed a little ahead of schedule, with an actual open date likely sometime in 2025. The track is actually now complete. It threatened to get mired in a stupid lawsuit from San Dimas over parking, but thankfully they settled. Good work, San Dimas! San Dimas High School Football Room! What about the further extension to Montclair? Well, we'll touch on that in a bit. So, the D-Line extensions all have different dates depending on what report you listen to. For Phase 1, one report is now saying service in the spring of 2025, which would be great, while another suggests that construction will finish then, which means an opening in the fall of 2025. When it does open, though, headways may be bad for a bit. See, there's a project called Division 20 that is upgrading the B&D Line's rail yard to allow for better headways when the D-extensions open, and it is, um way behind schedule. The reason? A consultant designed the project for light rail standards instead of heavy rail, which the B and D lines are. The magnitude of this fuck up is impressively vast, and the consequences are painful. I'll talk more about how this sort of thing can even happen in the first place in the other video about costs and timelines, so check that out when it's out for more info. To be fair, they did recently announce that they'll manage to get the yard partially open for Phase 1 completion, so that is something. One report has Section 2 of the D-Line extension to Century City also opening in the fall of 2025, but I'm going to call bullshit on that one considering the other report doesn't even have construction finishing for another year after that. In 2026, the Division 20 project will hopefully finally finish, allowing for better headways on the D-Line, but that's it for that year. And let's move on to 2027. The Noho Pasadena BRT is expected to finally be open by then, after being mired in opposition and lawsuits. Of course, the date risks pushing even further, and if you ask me to wager, I'd bet they actually squeak it in right before the Olympics in 2028. We'll see. As the map shows, an annoying amount of this BRT line is mixed flow for now. The G-Line improvements, which will, among other things, construct a few grade separations, will likely, or at least hopefully, open in early 2027 although no single segment will become fully grade separated, so it doesn't really change how it looks on this map at all with the design philosophy I'm using. Phase two of the D-Line extension to Beverly Hills and Century City is now expected to open in the first half of 2027. This phase has been mired in issues that have caused delays, including a suspension of work due to safety concerns, along with 66 million in change orders recently approved. There is now some question whether a second entrance at the Rodeo Drive station will be built. The mayor of Beverly Hills, Julian Gold, now opposes the second entrance, which would involve a long underground pedestrian tunnel because of cost increases and because he says, the people who do want to be in that, we probably don't want that. So we're going to have to look for some manner in which to get people from the portal to where they want to go in a way that is safe. Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills. You've been real jealous that Bel Air has been sucking up all of the stereotypical rich asshole oxygen lately, haven't you? The most basic utilitarian infrastructure can't survive the breathless fear of the Metro bringing crime to their upscale shopping street, which is an ages-old dog whistle. Just for some context on Beverly Hills' outlook on what they consider to be crime on Rodeo Drive, from March 2020 to July of 2021, the Beverly Hills Police Rodeo Drive unit arrested 106 people. 105 of those 106 people were black. The lone outlier? A dark-skinned Latino individual. This is a city that is less than 2% black. There is a very specific idea of what crime means in downtown Beverly Hills, so maybe we should take their concerns with a grain of very white salt. Meanwhile, a second entrance at Century City that would have served the Westfield Century City Mall has been nixed because the new owners didn't want it for some reason, but also could be trying to play chicken with Metro and get them to fund it themselves. Either way, pretty shitty. I mean, who could have foreseen this toxic energy out of Century City? 
Also in 2027, the C Now K line platform extensions seem to be back on the docket for completion by then, funded by state surplus money and some other grants. This will allow three car trains to run along the length of what will be the K line. Phase 3 of the D line is in a uh, little bit of trouble. The most recent reports have it missing its target of opening by the Olympics, where the Westwood station will serve some venues. This isn't great, and has Metro scrambling to work with the contractor to find a way forward that recovers the schedule by adding more work shifts. We'll keep an eye on this as it develops, but expect it to squeak in just before the games start. I don't really consider the Dodger Stadium gondola plan a transit project, as it's more a super low capacity tourist gimmick, and I'm not a huge fan of it, but I'll discuss it here regardless. It recently released an EIR and won a court victory, but it's still pretty unclear whether it'll actually get built or not. And if it does, when? If it manages to get approved, I'd expect it to open by 2028, but we'll see. I, for one, vastly prefer the Dodger Station be served by a future light rail extension, as I've discussed at length before. And speaking of 2028, Brightline West, the privately owned and mostly privately funded high-speed rail train between Vegas and Rancho Cucamonga, with stations at Victor Valley and Hesperia, plans to break ground this year and complete by 2028. They are aiming for a federal grant to cover a shortfall. But speaking of Rancho Cucamonga, a musk tunnel between it and Ontario Airport is shockingly not happening now, meaning that you'll never achieve your dreams of burning to death in a Tesla trapped in an underground traffic jam. At least, not outside of Vegas. Who knows what Ontario Airport will come up with next. Other transit projects still aiming to be done by the 2028 Olympics, which have made Metro's narrowed list for Olympics funding, are the Inglewood People Mover Phase 1 of Metrolink's SCORE program, fixes of some kind yet to be decided for the Washington Flower Junction, upgrades to 7th Metro Station, uh, the Vermont BRT, and the, quote, Quick Build BRT, which they are now calling BRT Light. Let's start with that Broadway BRT light, which, as mentioned, due to its proximity to the J-Line, I'm drawing as a local service to the Jays Express. It's a three-minute walk out of station to transfer, and I just wanted some good way to show this. I cannot stress enough how much this and the Vermont BRT project are basically a string of Metro stepping on rakes. In the middle of 2021, Metro wanted to pursue Broadway as the first of its quick build BRT projects intended to be open in just one year. 18 months later, they were finally planning to advertise for a contractor for a lengthy CEQA environmental study, which this sort of project is now technically exempt from needing due to a new California law. Now, this advertising for a contractor first got delayed by a month, uh, with a large funding shortfall and a prediction that CEQA and NEPA studies, the latter which they only needed if they're going after federal funding, and which definitely kills any chance of this being done quickly, would finish by 2026. Remember, that's just the studies, not the construction or operations of this supposedly one-year project. Then, advertising for a contractor for the studies got delayed another four months, and then dropped completely. I mean, possibly because they're now seeking sequel exemption, and are going for state Olympics money instead of federal money, meaning that they don't need NEPA either? It does seem like it. But now the project is unlikely to open before 2028, seven years after the stated intention to open it in one year because BRT projects are being built too slow, usually taking five years. Yes, instead of getting built quicker than the standard BRT, it's getting built even slower. And quite honestly, I don't know how this allegedly simple project got so utterly messed up. It ain't good though. Haven't had your fill of badly managed BRT yet? Well, luckily we've got Vermont for you. Now, this project has also been mired in endless studies and community meetings. They kept canceling their plans to start environmental review and doing more community engagement. Maybe because they think that'll shield them from potential future lawsuits as they're pursuing this for sequel exemption too. I don't know. On the upside, they have now finally awarded the EIR contract, which covers both BRT and rail for this northern Vermont section. The rail EIR will start once the BRT study is finished. But all told, this simple BRT line was in the community engagement phase of planning, not even environmental review, for 10 years now. Plus, they risk losing a state grant for taking so long. But hey, they say they're aiming for a 2028 completion. I've talked in the past about Metrolink's SCORE program, so I'll just summarize here that Phase 1 is all about increasing headways. They're aiming for 30-minute headways on the core network, which would be amazing. Glad to see that's a priority for 2028. Between the new Olympics money and the state surplus money that has already been awarded, I think this project might actually complete before the games. Now, let's talk about the Inglewood People Mover. It's in an interesting place. 
On one hand, it's been very successful in getting funding to date. In addition to getting the cancelled Sentinel Great Separation money to use as a backstop, it's been awarded $407 million from the state surplus, and as I write this, is waiting on its project rating from the FTA to know whether they're likely to get a federal capital investment grant. But that doesn't give them everything they need still. We'll come back to that in a second. There are three contractor teams vying for the contract. One of them induces the same technology as the LEX APM, technically allowing for them to meet up in the future, although I don't think that will ever happen for a host of reasons. And another of them teamed up with the shady monorail pushers, BYD. Terrifying, right? Well, there's some good news. BYD seems to have been kicked off of the partnership, so we're not at risk of BYD's very specific brand of shittiness here. Now, after personally taking the K-Line to Inglewood and sitting on the shuttle bus to SoFi in 40 minutes of traffic during one of the Taylor Swift shows, unfortunately I didn't get tickets to T-Swift, I was seeing Beck next door at the forum, which was also truly amazing, but man did I feel FOMO from being the one person on that bus not seeing Taylor Swift. Let's just say I deeply understand the need for this project now. I'm pretty sure it would have been faster to walk, and I considered it, but if I recall it was super hot that day. Considering this will serve the main Olympics venue, and is being prioritized for the Olympics opening, I mean, yeah, we need this thing. Here's the problem, though. Metro does not want to operate this as its own line, so while for Metro lines the funding conversation stops at construction, because the operations and maintenance budget gets wrapped up in normal Metro funding after that, this line will be separately operated, meaning it'll need to raise money for O&M in addition to construction. And while, if it gets the $1.2 billion FTA grant, it will have what it needs for construction, still needs to secure the money for O&M before they can actually move forward. Now you, a smart, logical person, might assume, wait, this is a line that's exclusively being built for the benefit of three private arenas, the Forum, SoFi, and the Under Construction Intuit Dome. And so far, entirely with a giant wad of public money. For the comparatively trifling cost of 10 to 12 million annually, surely the owners of those arenas are pitching in, right? Now comes the part where we throw our heads back and laugh. Ready? Ready! <laughs> Steve Ballmer's avoidance of this is particularly galling. The man considers himself a climate leader, and yet the one very obvious and direct climate change mitigation solution under his direct purview that isn't even that expensive is one he's trying to worm his way out of, which is just pretty shameless. Or shameful? Shame is involved. Shame. 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 If you've ever gone to a game or show at these arenas, you uh, know what the traffic and parking situation is like. The hours and hours of idling cars just pumping carbon into the air for every single event, which also serves as a massive barrier for even wanting to go to these shows. I mean, look, I go to concerts a lot. It's sort of one of my things. And I avoid these venues like the plague unless there's something I feel like I absolutely have to see because they're such a nightmare to get to. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that I am hardly alone in that. It'd be legitimately good business to help fund this, which is the only argument that Stan and Kroenke probably cares about, but you'd think that should be enough. Not to mention it makes it way easier for the huge number of employees of these venues to reach them, in addition to fans. Ultimately, they may be playing a game of chicken, assuming that if backed up against the wall they'll find some public money for it, and, since privatizing the gains and socializing the losses is basically the story of America, maybe they're right. But since we're the public, we can demand that they pay not even their fair share, is that would have been incredibly higher, but a share so small that it's almost insulting, and yet they're still trying to avoid. Let's put some pressure on Balmer and Kroenke especially, and make it clear that this service makes it far more likely for you to use their venues. Shame! Shame. Shame. The Arts District Station is trucking along with some new conceptual drawings and a planned draft EIR release sometime this year, but last word was that it was a little behind schedule on community meetings, so I'm going to be a bit more pessimistic than my previous prediction and say that this opens somewhere around 2028 to 2029 at best. And that may even be too optimistic, sadly, considering Metro didn't even list it in their latest planning summary, and it seems to have really fallen off their priority list given some of the high-profile headaches with their larger projects. It probably will be funded out of Central LA's discretionary Metro M funding, along with possibly a downtown EIFD, although there was recently some grim news there on that front, where it seems like a downtown EIFD wouldn't bring in as much money as previously hoped. 
Oh, and LAX wants Terminal 9 to open by the Olympic still, as far as I know, so let's add that station to the LAX APM. The foothill extension to Montclair was dealt a huge blow when they failed to get funds from the state surplus, which instead went to the Inglewood People Mover, the East San Fernando Valley Line, and the Metrolink Score program. Because of this, there is an expected five-year delay that will make the costs double from $461 million to $878 million, which is... Jesus. Like, Metro is now surprisingly making these two stations their top priority for future state funding, seeking $648 million, while also aiming to divert $150 million from other San Gabriel Valley projects. I honestly wonder if it's even worth it at this cost. It seems like this money could be used more efficiently elsewhere. And increased Metrolink headways, which already serve these two stations along with Pomona, and which I believe will already happen with SCORE anyway, could be enough for now. But Metro has been uncharacteristically confident that the state will fully fund it by July of next year, with an April 2025 target for a construction contract, possibly by diverting some formula funding now. So I'm going to put it on here with a 2030 open date. What else might open by 2030? A lot. The East San Fernando Valley Line, which was originally aiming for an opening before the Olympics, even I think at one point 2027, now expects to complete in 2030. Cost rose over a half a billion dollars for reasons, but it received about that money in new state surplus funding, so it's finally under construction. Or, at least, pre-construction. They've chosen a contractor, started utility relocations, and real construction starts in March of 2026, which seems like a while from now, but who am I to say? 2030 is a completion date for the southern phase at the moment. Uh, meanwhile, the northern phase is undergoing steady, with three options still being two light rail tracks alongside the Metrolink tracks, shared light rail and Metrolink tracks, and increased Metrolink service with an infill station, which I still am strongly betting will happen. The contract seems to state that the contractor will immediately roll into phase two, and if option three is selected, they'll have to build that station and double track that Metrolink section, which I'm kind of surprised the score isn't already doing, to be honest. That will probably take our slow-ass system three more years minimum, so I'll add that to the map once we get to 2033. And, ooh boy, it's time we get to this video's Sepulveda Line section. It's hard to know where to begin. I could make an entire series of videos about the back and forth between all the various players in this drama, but... No, there is too much. Let me sum up. We did great in all the relevant local elections except for City Attorney, which has made SOHA, the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, and Bel Air, big mad. Those two are still up to their shit. For SOHA's part, their usual exaggerated, weepy edicts keep coming, with claims like Metro will ruin Sherman Oaks, creating their own hilariously bad, scary renderings despite the fact that real renderings are available, getting Sherman Oaks Galleria to donate to their cause, complaining to city council member Bob Blumenfeld about everything, and torturing a poor Metro employee who patiently tried to explain capacity numbers to SOHA members who failed to grasp basic grade school math and continue erroneously insisting that the monorail is higher capacity. And Jesus, I have fucking covered this like three times before. It all stems from intentionally misleading sections of BYD's original report, which were clearly meant to mislead people in precisely this way. They're also raising money with Bel Air to fight against all tunneled options. So, Bel Air, what have they been up to? Well, they seem to have finally bought Congressman Brad Sherman, which is deeply unsurprising, and he is alarmingly now complaining to the Biden administration about the tunneled options on Bel Air's behalf, which is one of the more serious threats to the heavy rail options since this project will rely hugely on federal grants if it's to happen. Former Ticketmaster autocrat and current anthropomorphized personality disorder, Fred Rosen, has continued to send abusive screeds to any and all Metro employees he can find, including the one who has already screamed it by the math challenged SOHA members. Rosen threatened her with personal litigation, told her, You deserve no courtesy and are entitled no respect, called her despicable for being out of the office during the Christmas holidays, calling her a rodent, and promised to personally try to get her fired and publicly humiliated. Now, I don't know what this Metro public servant with the patience of a saint makes, but whatever it is, it is not enough, and we should absolutely not be subjecting human beings to this sort of rabid abuse because it's the only way to avoid a lawsuit. Which of course we're not even avoiding! More recent Fred emails, to any and every local official and transit reporter whose email addresses he can find, I can just imagine Karen Bass hitting report spam with a heavy sigh, claim that subways are about to be rendered obsolete by flying cars. Uh-huh. Flying cars. I'm going to keep saying it with that tone of voice. Flying cars. He also delusionally claims that no one has ever come up with a good criticism to his uh, points, and that instead people have focused on meaningless criticisms, like how often he uses dashes, 
likening them to the Dash Police. Anyway, so I mentioned a lawsuit. Yes, Fred has already filed one because he perceives Metro to be too slow in getting back to him on a public records request, along with telling Metro to preserve records for other future litigation. They're clearly going to throw everything they have at the wall and see what sticks here. Am I worried about that? Honestly, not really. Even Beverly Hills couldn't stop the Purple Line. Now, Fred Rosen claims to have better lawyers than Beverly Hills, but Fred Rosen's lawyers can't even get him to shut the fuck up. The absolute unhinged lunacy and abuse hurled by Rosen at Metro staff on public record will not serve to help his case. Fred Rosen and the Bel Air Association are I'm not... Serious people. But an overabundance of caution to make absolutely sure a project this critical doesn't get screwed by the dumbest man alive will probably slow this down a bit. Even though things are surprisingly progressing at a clip, I'm going to stretch my previous prediction and say maybe 2033 for the Sepulveda Line Phase 1 opening, which is in line with the original non-accelerated measure and prediction. What else is there to say about the Sepulveda Line? Well, unsurprisingly, much of the debate and outreach has centered around UCLA. In fact, Rosen arranged a meeting between the monorail contractor BYD, UCLA, SOHA, and Bel Air that Metro Warren violated BYD's contract. For BYD's part, they're trying to alter their plan to shore up some of their more obvious weak spots. They finally realize that the G-Line station is moving to Sepulveda and have added a new G-Line station that will connect to their monorail station, exactly as I predicted, which will of course increase their costs. They have moved to their atrocious 101 station when they realized they couldn't even build there and placed it pretty much where Heavy Rail has it at Ventura, which will almost certainly also increase their costs. They also studied a number of different people movers for Alternative 2, which connects a UCLA people mover to the Westwood station, and they seem to have settled on an underground one, which will absolutely explode their costs. BYD's partially underground Alt-3 winds a bit more to avoid as many Bel Air homes as possible, and they switch to single bore like Bechtel's heavy rail to avoid the ventilation shafts that, hilariously, only they were ever going to have, despite Bel Air and Rosen falsely screaming that the Bechtel heavy rail options would require them. They also somewhat fixed their long connection to Westwood Station by making the connection potentially underground, which will again increase their costs. Ultimately, they're bringing some elements of their alternatives, most specifically Alternative 3, closer in line to the heavy rail standards, but still not as good and still weighed down by a host of other fatal flaws inherent to the monorail in the first place. And now, the costs will be pretty much on par, I think. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if Alts 2 and 3 were more than Alt 4 now. Oh, and BYD spun off their American business into a new LA-based entity called RIDE, all caps, which seems to be an attempt to avoid losing federal funds that wouldn't be available to a Chinese company, and presumably to give the impression that the team is from LA and thus more trustworthy on LA issues. <laughs> UCLA administration caught some flack for the previously mentioned prohibited meeting and for seeming to express tentative support for Alt 2's people mover option, and for asking if a tunnel could avoid Bel Air just to avoid the goddamn headache, which is of course exactly what Bel Air wants, but it's moot, because it can. Their defense on the people mover comments was basically, it's better than Alt 1 at least, and if Bel Air kills the tunneling, we don't want to get stuck with Alt 1. But UCLA's student body has come out strongly in support of Heavy Rail. Weirdly, both the heavy rail and monorail teams have teamed up with different French companies to shore up their technology bona fides. Uh, Bechtel's heavy rail team now includes RATP, the operator of the Paris Metro, to ensure ease of running automated lines at 92nd headways. Although a new California labor law may prove to be a stumbling block for automated metro trains, something to keep an eye on. And BYD, or RIDE, has added Keolis, which operates some other railways in France. For their part, Bechtel has some interesting new ideas to use geothermal renewable energy, and we also got some more info from Metro on the traditional subway Alt 6. It seems they're going to have to move their Santa Monica Boulevard station for reasons undisclosed, but Alt 6 is probably not going to get chosen anyway. Throughout all this, Metro seems to be embodying a just keep swimming attitude, and pushing forward by the book responding to Bel Air's threats and rants with calmly presented FAQs and community outreach meetings. Which are taking longer than originally intended, pushing the draft EIR back from now, essentially, to the spring, but I think it's more likely that the draft EIR needed time and they're just filling the space with more meetings to firm up their community outreach bona fides for the inevitable litigation. 
When that draft EIR releases, we'll get cost estimates for each alternative, which I am so interested in. We'll finally see the reality versus what BYD was claiming. In fact, Soha's recent behavior is a clue that they know that costs are going to come back at skyrocketing levels for the monorail. See, Soha and Bel Air had been beating the drum of, we must go with the cheaper, more fiscally responsible option, but now Soha's framing it in terms of equity for the valley. They've actually gotten the San Fernando Valley Council of Governments, crucially not just Sherman Oaks now, to claim that if the line is underground on the west side, it should be underground in the valley, and they're only okay if it's elevated in the valley if it's also elevated on the west side. Obviously, the only alternatives that elevate it on the west side are the monorail alternatives. Alternative 4, the Bechtel heavy rail option that is most likely to be recommended by Metro staff, has the line elevated all throughout the valley. Alternative 5, the Bechtel heavy rail option that will be significantly more expensive than Alternative 4, buries the line through most of the valley except at the very end. Whereas Alternative 6, the traditional subway alternative, has it buried all throughout the valley. So it seems what Soha is trying to do is take Alternative 4 in particular off the table. Alternative 2 will get taken off the table with the whole underground people mover thing because it'll be insanely expensive, and Alternative 3 will get taken off the table because the monorail coalition includes Bel Air, who do not want it. So this would set up a showdown of Alternative 1, which would be incredibly horrible for UCLA in particular, versus Alternatives 5 or 6. Alternative 6 without private funding almost certainly won't be as competitive, so this then makes it truly a showdown of Alternative 1, the worst option overall by far, but also the cheapest monorail option, against Alternative 5, a much more expensive heavy rail option. If they're able to frame it so that it's a dichotomy between these two options, there is a real risk of the monorail being chosen. Heavy rail between these two alternatives will be more expensive, and they can argue that the slim portion of the line that's still elevated in the valley still means that there's inequity with the west side. Now, these arguments are obviously bullshit, but it's instructive to look at how political figures are reacting to such arguments now. Because it's the whole valley COG, there's suddenly a lot of deference to this equity demand. People voting for the action include two Metro board members, Catherine Barger and Paul Kerkorian. Voting to abstain was crucial Metro board member Lindsay Horvath, and excused from voting was Metro board member Ara Najarian. Meanwhile, Karen Bass, who controls four votes on the board, one of them being Krikorian's, has made comments wishing the Valley and the West Side would just all get along, and she seems to me to be signaling support for the San Fernando Valley COG motion in an attempt to form a coalition. But again, the coalition is a trap, because it sets up a showdown of Alt-1 versus Alt-5, with the much less expensive Alt-4 being taken off the table, even though it's to my eyes the option that makes by far the most sense. Even with all of this, I think there's still a good shot for Alt-5 to get chosen, because this corridor is so important and federal money will be available, and Alt-1 absolutely shafts UCLA, which will become a huge sticking point for it. But we're not out of the woods yet. Because we've got politicians making the mode and routing decisions instead of Metro staff, we're still at risk of this all getting fucked. And while Bel Air is just thrashing about wildly, and isn't really much of a threat in my opinion, the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association is on the move, and despite not understanding basic math, they do know what they're doing. Making it clear to transit-friendly officials, like Lindsay Horvath in particular, that heavy rail is absolutely crucial here is really important, and I strongly recommend everyone reach out to Horvath, along with City Council member Katie young Yaroslavsky, and express your support for heavy rail. And oh look, I'm adding another section as this edit drags on because there is still more on the Sepulveda line, but don't worry, <laughs> this bit's fun. In community meetings, uh, ones where Soha and Bel Air distributed flyers to attendees, because of course they did. My friend Fred Rosen from Bel Air and I wrote this. We're going to hand these out at the Metro meeting. That should be an interesting thing to do. Does the state have an extra 10, 12, or $20 billion for this, this project? Well, talk about a not leading question there. <laughs> okay. But I think that it should be something that gets people to UCLA that people will want to ride, that's convenient, that's fast, that's good for the rider, that doesn't force people to sort of stand in the middle of a highway, for instance, something that's, you know, that's nice for the user. It is funny to see them get slapped down by Laura Friedman here, and a refreshing take from a politician. Uh, sorry, got off track. <clears throat> in community meetings, Metro just released their updated travel time and ridership projections by Alternative and Station, and oh boy, are they... 
hilarious if you're a Heavy Rail fan. This is genuinely one of the most validating documents I've ever read. Let's just start here that alts 4 and 5 have almost equal 120,000 daily ridership, which is incredible, and would make it the busiest metro line in LA. 6 actually has a bit of a fall off, probably cementing its fate and taking it off the board, but the monorail alts <laughs> 1 and 2 are just over half of the heavy rail. Half! And 3 isn't much better. If you look by station, you can really pinpoint where some of the big problems are. In Alt-1? Oh weird, it turns out a shitty shuttle bus to pick people up from UCLA only nets you 900 daily riders versus the over 18,000 from Alts 4 and 5, and that underground people mover in Alt-2 still only drags in under 6,000 with its multiple stations. The Sherman Way monorail ridership is anemic compared to Heavy Rail, less than a quarter, probably because of that bad location versus Heavy Rail, exactly as I pointed out two years ago. The Getty Center Station barely nets a thousand daily riders, again, exactly as I pointed out. I'm sorry, I'm gloating, but I, I feel like, don't we all deserve to gloat over this? Basically, if my predictions about the costs pan out, Heavy Rail is going to blow the monorail out of the water in cost-effectiveness. I expect Alt-4 to be by far the most cost-effective. Alt-5 is basically delivering us the same riders for one minute faster and more money, so it won't be as strong as Alt-4, but it will almost definitely beat Alts 2 and 3 in cost per rider, and honestly, may still even beat Alt-1. Like, I think it's a toss-up on whether Alt-1 or 5 will have higher cost per rider. And given the doubled ridership and much higher time savings on Alt-5, if the cost per rider are the same, they'll probably still choose 5. Hopefully. Of course, considering the only tangible benefit that 5 gives over 4 besides a minute of travel time is slightly less pissed off Sherman Oaks NIMBYs, I think we ought to still just build 4, but okay, 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 I, I gotta wrap this up, it's basically its own video at this point. When the EIR finally releases in the spring, I'll make another video addressing it, since the public comments period will open. Metro will finally select an alternative based on this EIR in the following comments period, so it is critical that people pay attention and make sure their voices are heard. So the most important transit link in the western United States isn't trashed due to the machinations of the monumental asshole who invented service fees. Whew, now let's get real angry about something else. Link Union Station, the project to first create pass-through tracks at Union Station with a viaduct over the 101, and then widen and renovate the station itself in a second phase, is absolutely flailing. Maybe even more so than the Broadway and Vermont BRTs. Metro canceled the Phase 1 contractor bidding to ostensibly pursue a NEPA environmental study that would allow them to compete for federal funds, then almost approved the new contractor, and then disqualified them for conflicts of interest and in having proprietary information and then kept delaying new contractor approval and the NEPA study. At this point, it's running five years late, meaning costs have doubled from $950 million to $1.93 billion, so phase one completion is now at 2033 with no real funding plan for the new massive shortfall, and phase two is just a twinkle in the eye of the next generation. Fabulous. Since we're now in 2033, let's finish phase two of the East San Fernando Valley, which I think will be the Metrolink infill and capacity increase. 2033 is also the date where some of the cancelled 710 North extension money might finally get used for BRT and the SGV. Don't call it home. This section is particularly looking at a short Valley Boulevard BRT line between Union Station and the 710. Now, there's also a separate Valley Boulevard BRT project using the money from the State Road 60 cancelled East Side extension, but that doesn't become available until much later, so I'm drawing it as this little step for now. It may also grade separate the Amtrak tracks along this path, which I think should be a new tongue twister, so that's a nice bonus. However, I don't see anything in new documents about a potential Huntington BRT which had been discussed before. For the 710 South cancelled extension, there's a massive list of projects it might support. The only rapid transit projects mentioned are adding money to the pot for existing other projects, with the exception of a Metrolink Antelope Valley Line extension to Long Beach. This would uh, be wildly expensive and a massive undertaking, plus it didn't score great, so I'm comfortable filing this under things that definitely won't happen, at least with this money. At best, it probably helps some other existing projects like the West Santa Ana Ranch actually open closer to on time. As I edit, they keep refining this and they aim to have recommendations by January. Not a ton has happened on Crenshaw North this year beyond the EIR finally getting worked on in the background, which honestly is already better than most other projects. Basically, all support is behind the hybrid alignment now, and I don't think anyone seriously thinks any other alignment would happen barring major issues. 
I, of course, just moved to a spot that would have been excellently served by Beverly La Brea Station, but... <sighs> C'est la vie. Lindsay Horvath had secured a commitment for a fall EIR release, which would have been great, but uh, they must not have been very committed to the commitment because it's now coming in the spring, like the Sepulveda one. Metro says this partly has to do with needing more work on the funding plan, since its Measure M money is way off into the future. Pursuant to this, Laura Friedman, again coming through, introduced a bill to help fund this by allowing an EIFD in WeHo to last for 75 years instead of 45. Another thing being looked at is developing the Division 7 bus yard and adjacent sheriff's office, which occupy a huge amount of prime real estate between Santa Monica and the Pacific Design Center. Metro has unsurprisingly stated that it'll need to get built in phases. Once the EIR is done, WeHo wants Metro to immediately begin pursuing preliminary engineering, which would cost about $100 million. And there is so much energy behind this, along with real funding potential without waiting for its Measure M fund availability, that I think it will be one of the few projects actually open vastly far ahead of its target Measure M date, which is 2047. I would say Phase 1 to Wilshire could open by 2033. I think WeHo would push for even sooner, and it's a relatively short segment, but Metro isn't giving me a ton of confidence right now. The Southern Vermont Corridor between 120th and the PCH was not recommended for a near-term project per a recent study, but I think by 2033, especially if we finally get better at building BRT, is about when Metro might extend the Vermont BRT southward. By the same logic, I expect the quick-build BRT corridors will have gotten at least a little faster, and will have managed at least two of the other four by now. I consider the Atlantic and Sunset Quick Build BRTs to be two sides of the same coin and will probably operate as one line, so let's draw both of those on. And note that my predictions here about where it will and will not have bus lanes are totally my own guesses and not, like, me wish-casting it. The east side extension to Whittier has also hit a rather galling cost overrun, with the full line to Whittier now expected to cost $10.1 billion. Partly for this reason, Metro is now phasing this and will start first with a phase to Greenwood, and that will start at $7.4 billion and is expected to open in 2035. Part of the issue is that the FTA is using a cost estimates model adopted under the Trump administration that requires projects to have much higher contingency funds, which has affected a ton of projects, including the East San Fernando Valley Line and the West Santa Ana Branch, which we'll get to next. Some have accused the model of having been adopted in a bad faith effort by Trump's FTA to kill transit projects in their infancy, which does pass the smell test. But if that was true, you would think Pete's FTA would have rescinded it. Instead, as we'll see in my forthcoming cost timelines video, it seems that the FTA genuinely thinks that it's a good idea, and that they'd rather be under budget on a huge budget than over budget on a smaller budget, even if the former results in them spending more. And then there's the huge issue that, if contractors know that that contingency is available, they will adjust their bids to make sure they get every cent of that money and more. Contractors are like a gas. They expand to fill the space. So the FTA really needs to get their heads out of their asses. So this is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. But again, not in this video. Anyway, Eastside is now in the phase where it's actively seeking federal money, like federal capital investment grants, so let's hope it gets it. And what seems to be a rarity these days, there's a coalition of cities along the line that actually wants it. So, hey, that helps. On to the West Santa Ana branch, phase one to Slauson. Lots to discuss here. I know I keep saying I'll make a video specifically about this line, and I haven't yet, but maybe one day. So, the bad news starts with, shocker, exploding costs. For the exact same reason they exploded for the east side extension. FTA contingency rules and delays. From 4.9 billion, we're now at 7.1 billion, and with constant demands for new studies and negotiations to relocate 8.1 miles of freight rail track, things are going slow. So we need a lot of money. Good news, it's already put the grant requests in. Let's see how it's going. Oh, so the West Santa Ana branch did not get a $400 million federal grant it was seeking due to it not being cost effective, um, not submitting a required analysis, and not having capacity to carry out the project. Oof, okay, not great. Uh, what about state funding? Oh, nope, zero from the California surplus. Um, okay. So the math tells us that with the ballooning budget and the lost grants, we're now looking at a $4.5 billion shortfall, almost the entire original budget before they changed contingency recalculations. Not great. County Supervisor Catherine Barger thinks it's all because of the name West Santa Ana Branch. 
Uh, Karen Bass was confused by it and thought it was an Orange County project. Hilda Solis asked for a letter designation five years ago and it still hasn't gotten it. So now the strategy to get funding is... A new nine month, $450,000 study to choose a different name. Look guys, I'll do it for just $400,000. The Gateway Line. You can wire me the money. Meanwhile, facing this funding crisis, the coalition of cities along the line have, one, opposed land banking, two, been desperately trying to wriggle out of their mere 3% local contribution, three, have opposed an EIFD because they think their city's land use is already best the way it is, it's not, and they spent the meeting after the state funding denial discussing a new logo and debating what to do with a former director's copy machine. Okay, so we need an actual new funding plan, STAT. Uh, Metro started out by saying that the West Santa Ana branch was now their second priority for future state funding, um, confusingly behind the previously mentioned Claremont Montclair Foothill stations, which, okay, I mean, this seems more important, but okay. Their next attempts to get funding will be a $1 billion grant from state, a $3.1 billion federal New Start grant, and $400 million in federal funding to make up for that $4.5 billion shortfall but they need to go from losing every grant request to winning everyone. I mean, every one. And amidst all this, Cerritos sued Metro, but that's already been resolved, and I don't even want to wade into it, honestly. I'll just say that now Metro has agreed to study a Cerritos infill at some point, if they ask, that there will be no permanent property acquisitions in Cerritos, and <sighs> no parking impacts. Sure. Gotta keep that Auto Square branding, I guess. Cerritos Auto Square. So, assuming funding is finally secured without any further delay, we get like a 2035 opening date for the first segment. And even that is starting to feel optimistic. Although Metro is trying to sound optimistic about it, going on about groundbreaking soon despite not having funded it. Now let's talk about the formerly C, soon to be K line extension to Torrance. And now it comes in four flavors. Two of the original options follow the Harbor Subdivision, the right-of-way that Metro owns, one version a mix of elevated and grade, and the other partially trenched, while a third travels elevated on Hawthorne Court portion instead, stopping at the South Bay Galleria instead of the Redondo Beach Transit Center. A new fourth is very similar to the elevated and that grade right-of-way option, with I believe two more grade separations and a very slight deviation in route to get around an intersection. They're calling this the hybrid. But it truly seems to be a battle between Hawthorne and one of the two non-trenched right-of-way options that are very similar. So, the right-of-way being available was a big part of the justification for this project, and the expense for Hawthorne is so vast, especially for a mere two-station extension with relatively low ridership that the cost-effectiveness will be in the basement, tanking any chance it has to get the federal or state grants it needs to actually make it to construction. And that's before Caltrans gets their hands on it, and that's Caltrans of recent demote an employee for pointing out its agency policy to try to improve environmental outcomes instead of just widening freeways fame. See, Hawthorne will need Caltrans approval, it turns out, and to even become subject to their approval, it'll need to first do a whole extra lengthy and expensive federal NEPA review. And then Caltrans, who hate playing ball with Metro, can still say no. In a total vacuum, yeah, Hawthorne's a fully grade separated alternative that's closer to the ideal of a rail line, but there are places where the cost just does not justify that, especially if you won't be able to get the money it needs to get built anyway. If the Metro Board chooses the Hawthorne alignment, it's likely to kill the project, which in turn kills the future extension the Metro wants to eventually do to Long Beach, an extension that would make this entire line pretty damn important. So why would they choose Hawthorne then? Well, local pressure has been intense, and quite frankly, it gives you whiplash even trying to follow it. Of the three cities along the alignment, let's start with Redondo Beach. Redondo Beach has been set on the Hawthorne alignment from the start, but lately the voices have gotten louder. The city is reportedly spending $400,000 to sue Metro. We got a BRR, it'd be $400,000 to sue Metro on CEQA. We've already funded it. With one Redondo council member saying that Hermosa should stand with Redondo, like, th the U.S. stands with Israel. And... What? I... What? Are we just doing analogies mad libs now? The current torrent of human suffering in the Middle East calls to mind your desire to help block a rail alternative? What? Anyway, next there's Lawndale, 
who originally asked to not have a station in their city, mostly to warm out of the 3% local contribution they'd be required to make to that station, and then they threatened to sue to stop the project because it passed through them without serving them like they asked. But then they rescinded the threat and also shifted to supporting Hawthorne, while seemingly extracting a similar promise from Metro that Cerritos did, asking them to study an infill station on the Hawthorne alignment later if they ask, so helping to pay for it can become future Hawthorne's problem instead of current Hawthorne's problem. And then there's Torrance. Originally, Torrance supported the right-of-way option the Metro also wanted, but two Torrance City Council members recently decided to change their stance and support no build instead, citing concerns over being in the end of the line where they fear homeless will get off and wander at the end of the night. And I want to talk about this a little bit. In a previous and now removed video, I pointed out that one of those council members, John Kaji, is a developer who had a proposal to develop a parcel above Little Tokyo Station rejected by Metro, and I linked his switch in support to that event. My understanding had been that the time between the two events was relatively short, but it turns out it was three years, as helpfully and very aggressively pointed out by Kaji's lawyer in a cease and desist. I removed the video specifically because accuracy and fairness is important to me, and I agree with Kaji's assertion that the fact that he supported the right-of-way alignment for years after his proposal was rejected means there is probably no link there. Although I think for transparency's sake, as a general rule, having public officials recuse themselves on votes where they've had business interactions with the subject of the vote in the past is probably a good idea. For example, Metro board members are regularly expected to recuse themselves on votes where they've received donations from contractors who are the subject of the vote. This nips any questions about impropriety in the bud. But taking Kaji at his word that his issue with the project stems from concerns over homelessness that he's heard from constituents, I want to address that. So this project will not be completed for at least a decade at the earliest, and the situation in LA in a decade will likely be different than it is right now. Of course, it could be worse, but it could be a lot better. I would encourage Kaji and other politicians to adopt a forward-thinking instead of fatalistic approach, to aim to improve the transit accessibility of your constituents in the future while also seeking to address affordable housing deficits that are the ultimate root of the explosion of homelessness in LA. In fact, an elected official who is also a developer seems to be in an ideal position to do that. And in an op-ed, Kaji does seem to be opening the door to voting for one of the rail alternatives instead of no build, provided that Metro comes up with a plan to address safety concerns, notably putting the onus on Metro. using a very odd metaphor to do so. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security was established. The Transportation Security Administration was tasked with protecting passenger aviation. Metro needs to take a similar approach to ensure the protection of the riding public. You know, I think I'm going to start a new online course of appropriate metaphors for discussing rail alternatives for South Bay politicians. I see a career in this. The alignment was supposed to be chosen by Metro in October, but surprise, they, say it with me, punted to the spring. This time at County Supervisor Holly Mitchell's request, possibly to give them time to build consensus, but also maybe to just make it so the decision happens after the primaries in case she pisses everyone off. Not sure who she's afraid of pissing off, though, considering polling has the public vastly in support of the right-of-way option, which, when I point that out, has all the Hawthorne people sputtering that the polling is a uh, fake, which, you know, Cool. I know it seems like, especially for this amount of money, that we ought to maybe just cut our losses and can this thing in favor of a part of town that actually wants it. But the thing is, people do actually want the line, and it'll both help the locals immensely and serve as an important piece of a longer line in the future. Plus, we don't want to set the precedent that these tiny municipalities can single-handedly wreck regional transit. We have way too many tiny municipalities here to let that become a trend. And, if the project is cancelled, the allotted Measure M money still has to be spent in the South Bay and will almost certainly be used on freeways, and nope, we're not going to keep doing that. Anyway, uh, the map here shows the Hawthorne alignment instead of the right-of-way one because I made these animations in pretty much another lifetime before I knew about the Caltrans issues. So, just pretend that the South Bay Galleria station is Redondo Beach Transit Center. This would nominally happen in December 2034, but probably actually in 2035. From here on out, schedules are murky, and I'm kind of making barely educated guesses about the orders of things, so I probably won't be as specific most of the time. Now, let's get back to a part of town that actually does want transit. I think Crenshaw North Phase 2 will come maybe three years on the heels of Phase 1, and that would put it roughly at 2036. Since I made this animation, though, they said that the hybrid would actually be built in three phases, most likely, shown like this, but I don't have the third phase separate here in this video. 
The other most important thing that came out of these community meetings, though, is that the ridership for the full K-Line with Crenshaw North is bonkers. Nearly 100,000 for the hybrid, only 20,000 less than the Sepulveda line, which is incredibly good for light rail. This project would have higher ridership per mile than any existing light rail line in the entire country, including based on pre-pandemic ridership. Yes, this would be the most used light rail per mile in the nation. And it is really annoying to me that Measure M was constructed in a way that means we have to prioritize small projects with comparatively poor ridership and cost effectiveness for immediate funding, despite local jurisdictions fighting tooth and nail to block them, when there is a comically high ridership project sitting in front of them that the local jurisdiction, WIO, is literally begging for, that will be approved for any grant it asks for, and we can't access local funding until 2047 unless we scrap together a million bake sale ideas to do it. I mean, look, I actually think we will, and that we'll have this whole line built by the late 2030s instead of the 2050s, but, like, it should be under construction now, and it should not be this hard. Slam dunk, people. I mean, come on. <sighs> now let's discuss Metrolink infill stations. It's practically ritual at this point for me to throw the Grand Visonora and River Park proposed Metrolink stations on the map, but there has not been a peep about either of these two for years, since 2019, and as mentioned in an earlier video, they don't take California high-speed rail into account, which we are nominally supposed to get at some point. So I'm going to finally leave these off the map until we hear otherwise. Instead, though, there are new Metrolink infill stations to discuss. Metro has been asked by the board to stay a Pico Rivera infill station, which is happening with a bit over-the-top rendering, so I'm not sure these people have seen a commuter rail station. The idea is for it to be in service by 2030. Then, they've completed an initial study of adding an infill station at the LAC-USC Medical Center J-Line stop, which would cost between $51 and $110 million, depending on pedestrian bridge design choices. Next, there's a Metrolink station currently under construction at Vista Canyon, which I somehow missed on my last video, but it's off the edge of this map in the Santa Clarita area, so nothing to really show here. They're also studying moving the Sun Valley station to either Sunland or Van Nuys, the latter of which is exactly where Phase 2 of the East San Fernando Valley line might build an infill station anyway. Since that station will already have been added via another project, I'm just going to leave the Sun Valley station here. Oh, and there's the Placentia station that's eternally coming soon, for which I have no further information. They're also studying moving the Metrolink stations at El Monte to combine it with the bus station, uh, Montebello Commerce to be closer to the E-Line station, but still not close enough that I'm calling it an out-of-station connection, and Northridge, where one day something more rapid than the current bus lines on Reseda could theoretically connect to it. One day, maybe, California high-speed rail could reach Los Angeles. It's been on the struggle bus with federal grants, having been denied one for $1.3 billion and one for $67 million, but it seems to have gotten some state funding at least. One of the seven great separations it would need to get from Burbank to LA at Dorn Street was just funded as a Metrolink project, so hey, that's, uh, that's something. But you know what we did get? Renderings. I find it hilarious that even California High Speed Rail doesn't seem to think that Link Union Station Phase 2 will be done before it. Yikes. Anyway, let's just draw this thing to Burbank, which will happen first. Uh, maybe by 2036? Like, at the absolute extreme earliest at this point? Uh, at some point, the second or technically third phase of the East Side Extension will go to Whittier, so let's call that 2038. And why not place the West Santa Ana Branch, or, <clears throat> sorry, Gateway Line Phase 2 in the same year? This is the stretch between Slauson and Union Station. Remember, they ruled out a 7th Metro terminus a bit ago, and they've been going through successive studies to figure out exactly how to build this, specifically at what grades and where the stations will be. The $8 billion cost is, um, high, so they want to find a way to reduce it. They've narrowed it down from 6 to 5 to 2 concepts. In each, it transitions from aerial to at grade to cross underneath the 10, and then one switches underground for the rest of the alignment, while the other goes back to aerial through the industrial district before switching back to underground for Little Tokyo and staying there. There's a minor alignment option for the latter concept, but for both concepts they decided to keep the Little Tokyo Station, but still lacking an underground connection to the regional connector Little Tokyo Station, which is deeply annoying. And both concepts place the Union Station... station a few levels below and slightly west of the A-Line platforms. This ultimately lowers the $8.04 billion cost to $7.75 billion for the first concept and $6.72 billion for the second concept, which, hey, I mean, that's actually something. Nice work, Metro. 
The second more elevated concept has more surface impacts, obviously, but it's the only one where the cost per mile performs well, which they will absolutely need for federal grants, so I'd put a lot of money on that being the chosen concept. This brings us up to 2040, which I'm going to ballpark as, at this rate, the earliest California high-speed rail will reach Union Station. Then there's the High Desert Corridor, whose steadies, at least, are progressing at a clip. This will one day allow a bright line route to hit Union instead of just Rancho Cucamonga. The actual predicted dates on here are hilariously optimistic and rely on 4.7 to 5.8 billion of funding, which is, um not going to come that fast, and almost certainly not going to preempt the mainline California high-speed rail route. So I'm going to draw on here circa 2040 instead, even though that's probably way too early. 2040 is also in the ballpark of one I'd guess a conversion of the northern phase of Vermont BRT to rail might open. It's unfunded, but like I mentioned, the study is funded into the Vermont North BRT study contract. The chosen firm will roll into it right when they finish the BRT study. The multiple contractor proposals for the study actually give us some interesting tidbits. The proposal from the firm that was chosen suggested studying three alternatives for a heavy rail junction at Wilshire, Vermont to connect it to the B&D lines in addition to a standalone light rail alternative. But I continue to think that Metro will not want to rebuild the junction and will build this as light rail traveling below grade until Slauson. I think the BRT above will actually survive as its own line between Sunset and Slauson, since the rail would be underground along this whole section, but I only came to that conclusion after already doing a bunch of the graphics, so I'm uh, going to add it in again at the very end, um, but just pretend it's here. But while I've drawn this option, there's actually another option, off-sided by observers, that was brought up by two of the rejected proposals, but that I think Metro will ask the chosen firm to steady having the rail turn northeast to connect at MacArthur Park instead. This would allow a future northward expansion to Glendale, and would apparently shave $200 million off the price tag, both prospects that I think could be very inviting for Metro. Other worthy ideas from the rejected proposals include constructing shallow cut-and-cover stations in the Vermont median, and making one mile of Vermont car-free along UCLA and Expo Park, the latter of which would save $300 million and also just be generally awesome. So I hope these ideas are studied by the firm that was actually chosen. Now, let's talk about the other SGV BRT projects. Now, money for these from Metro M comes available in 2057, but I think by 2040 we maybe will have finally figured acceleration out, uh, and or have succeeded finally in getting BRT cheaper via the quick build philosophy. Who knows? Anyway, the San Gabriel Valley study keeps narrowing down alternatives, and the two highest performing ones? East-West on Valley for $445 million, and North-South on Rosemead for $275 million. The very two I predicted when the State Road 60 route got cancelled. But fascinatingly, now that they've chosen the route for this Valley Boulevard BRT, it is not an extension of the previously drawn Valley Boulevard BRT that's being funded out of the cancelled 710 North extension. This actually starts further south at the Atlantic E-Line station, and hits Valley Boulevard later. Which definitely threw me for a loop. It starts at Atlantic station, where it will go up to travel along Garvey, and then at Santa Anita it'll switch to Valley. Note that, as defined now, it will stop at the El Monte J-Line and Metrolink stations, but by the time this is built, the Metrolink station and the J-Line station will probably be one and the same. The Rosemead BRT is drawn here, at least at the beginning, is only going between Valley Boulevard and Washington Rosemead station, at least in this document. There's also a survey that asks people about four north-south concepts, including one on Citrus and Grand, one on Azusa, and one on Peck, and with a longer Rosemead BRT that starts at Sierra Madre Villa, and it would go to Long Beach in a future extension. But it does seem they've already decided on short Rosemead and their hybrid east-west route for now, so I'm going to keep these two. Um, while we're here, let's add the final other two quick build BRTs, which are Venice and La Cienega. And while we're at it, the West Side Council of Governments wants further BRT on Sepulveda, Washington, La Brea, Jefferson, Wilshire, Santa Monica, Pico, and Lincoln, which is also a Metro M project. And Jesus, I've made this complaint before, but too much BRT for the map. I do think we can narrow it down, though, because a wish list is not what'll actually happen, so let's think about this for a sec. The Sepulveda basically replicates the Sepulveda line, so we're going to ignore that. Washington runs very close and parallel to the Venice Quick Build, which is also on the West Side list, so let's ignore Washington. Its Los Angeles Jefferson BRTs are also accounted for as one line in the Quick Build BRT, so already happening. And then of course we add Lincoln as well, which is already a Metro M project, so that's definitely happening. Wilshire already has the D-line there and already partly has bus lanes even, but I'd be surprised if it got full BRT on top of that instead of just more bus lanes, so leaving that off. 
Uh, Santa Monica does make sense, but it says between Doheny and Centinella. And I think extending that just a little bit east to the Santa Monica San Vicente station on the K line is important, so I'm going to do that. And Pico as this short stub makes sense, but all you really need is a slight connector on Bundy to make it one service with the Santa Monica BRT, so I'm going to do that. And La Brea, which, hey, near where I live right now. Love it. So this is a good place to mention I'm using numbers instead of letters for BRT on this map because I think it will be easier to differentiate them when we have a lot more of them out there. At some point, I do think that the Vermont Rail will get extended south. Uh, it seems there is an intention to build a Phase 2 of the Inglewood People Mover. As mentioned before, if Bombardier is chosen as a contractor, it could technically link up to the LAX APM and become one service, but there are both bureaucratic obstacles to this as well as logistical ones, since the terminus of the LAX People Mover is some um, sort of embedded into the rental car facility, meaning you'd probably have to build a junction somewhere else and run it as a branched service. I doubt that will happen. The Phase 2 specified by local officials is one that extends the service to the sea line, with this as a very old example, but we'll use it for lack of anything else. Next, there is now a study to extend the new Aero DMU service, which are diesel trains running more like a metro than a commuter rail, to Union along the San Bernardino line at 30 minute intervals. The interesting thing about this to me is that it effectively duplicates the San Bernardino line service, just with the Redlands extension at the end of it, and SCORE aims to run Metrolink trains every 30 minutes anyway. So I think whether this happens or not depends on what gets funding first, this or SCORE, but it seems like SCORE already has the funding, so I'm gonna leave it off. While we're here, let's add the steadied Coachella Valley Metrolink line, which will probably get built at some point and on this map runs along the same route as the 91 Paris Valley Line. Eventually, phase two of the Sepulveda Line will open, so let's throw that on the map, along with the Sea Line extension to Norwalk. Note that while I've drawn this with no intermediate stations because old animation, competing proposals, one older one from Norwalk and one new one from the Rail Integration Study, both have intermediate stations, two each along either Imperial or Firestone. And now let's finally convert the G Line to Light Rail, one of the last measure on projects. Uh, several years ago, Metro was confusingly asked by a California Assembly member to study extending the Gold Line to Burbank Airport, and it gave the agency a million dollars to do that. Um, in the two years since, Progress has been emails back and forth asking what the hell that actually means. Since, you know, it pretty much makes no sense. So I'm not going to include that as a planned project right now, but just know that that's something that's happening in the background. And at this point, roughly infinity years into the future, but still technically planned, I'm going to put the D-Line extension to Santa Monica because the West Side COG is spending $20 million on pre-development activities for it, whatever the hell that means. And the California High Speed Rail extensions to Anaheim and then San Diego, with the original Brightline route possibly reaching Union via this connection as well. Um, also adding Amtrak service to Norwalk Santa Fe Springs and downtown Burbank, as the regional rail plan recommends doing eventually. And then there's a stated intention to convert the Nojo Pasadena and Lincoln BRTs to light rail extensions. The Lincoln BRT is pretty easy to draw as a sea line extension, although I'm going to change the routing to have an underground LMU station and a better situated Playa Vista station. Noho Pastina is a lot harder because some of the routing isn't ideal for a light rail line, so I think it'll actually run on Chandler and then switch down to Glen Oaks. I talk about this in my video about Metro projects after Measure M, but here I'm just drawing the light rail only as the extension of the G-Line. Also, I don't think these Pasadena stations would actually happen as light rail, but let's try to manifest it by drawing it on. And I'll count that earlier San Gabriel Valley survey as an excuse to say that they're planning the Rosemead BRT extensions up to Sierra Madre Villa and down to Long Beach, so here we go, and hey, look at that, all the airports have access now. Kind of. Ish. In a weird but welcome turn, this project is actually being actively promoted by Pico Rivera, who have funded an early study themselves and are trying to get money for a full EIR. They say that they want this open between 2029 and 2032, but uh, considering there's no plan to actually fund construction and it'll be a bit pricey considering its length, I would not say I'm optimistic on that front. Maybe with the new momentum it won't happen as late as I have it here, but it's not going to happen that early, especially since the first money actually earmarked for the first part of it from the State Route 60 cancelled Eastside route comes online only in 2053. Oh, and one last thing. Measure M has a provision for setting a C, now K, line extension to Long Beach, so we'll draw that in too. At least assuming our friends in Torrance let it get even that far.
You may notice a lot of my timeline predictions are significantly bleaker this year than last. Uh, that's because Metro has gone backwards, not forwards, on schedule, and in a pretty big way. No project beyond the ones listed here are getting completed in the 2020s at this point. A lot of these 2030s projects can maybe get accelerated by a year or two with the paradigm shift at Metro sometime this decade, especially if new funding opportunities arise. And a lot of the 2040s and 50s projects could also move up to the 2030s, but right now I would expect anything slated for 2035 or sooner in this video, which is essentially all the projects currently in active planning or construction, to slip back instead of forward. The projects not yet in active planning can still benefit from a variety of changes that the funding and timelines video will identify, so if you want to make a difference, I would definitely check that video out when it's finally up. And something interesting in here to know, I've also talked a lot about how funding some of these projects might be easier if we shift highway funding over to rail funding, which we should be doing anyway, because we all know what induced demand is and we do not need to be doing any more highway widening. Speaking of which, remember that Caltrans whistleblower I mentioned earlier? She's rightfully kicking up a hornet's nest of scrutiny around all kinds of shady Caltrans practices. So this presents a really valuable opportunity to shine a light on the harm that highway widening and freeway expansion causes, and how it's in direct opposition to our environmental goals. We're in the perfect moment to pressure California politicians to do something about this. And locally, in 2027, there's a provision in Measure M that gives an opportunity to reassess that highway funding. So we've got four years to make a lot of noise, and then theoretically in 2027, they could move a chunk of highway funding to rail funding. So between Caltrans now and Metro over the next four years with Measure M highway funding, there's a lot of noise we can make and a lot of change we can advocate for. The next video should come soon. I really, really hope it comes soon. So keep an eye out. It aims to answer a lot of the questions that I've been asking about why everything is taking so much longer and costing so much more recently. And we'll have some key recommendations for getting us back on track. Until next time.